Good morning, everybody. Uh, get this thing up and going. Okay, I consider myself to be an extremely fortunate person because I found myself in a position where I've actually turned my hobby into my career. So, being a biologist, I've managed to travel the world and go fishing in some wonderful destinations from the tropics to the Arctic Circle. I've also seen some really strange things, as you can see the signboard up there. And I've also done some crazy things, amongst which include putting on a suit and a tie attending meetings. <laughs> For all biologists, I think it's, it's the field trips um, is the reason why we pursued this career. But the field trips also provide us with an opportunity to reflect on our careers, where we've come from and where we're going to. And I must say, in the last couple of years, I've become rather worried about what I have done, my worth as a scientist, in terms of the impact of the work that I've been doing. And the reason I say that is because a lot of the fish species, the most sought after recreational fish species, the stock status looks something like that. They're either considered to be collapsed or overexploited. And these are the species that myself and my students are working on. So that's why I say I start challenging or questioning my worth. Are we doing the right things? The reason for the st this stock status is quite easily seen here. Recreational angling is a huge activity along our shores. Um, and over the last 50 years, thousands, and in fact millions of recreational anglers have participated in slowly eroding away those resources, okay? It's estimated that we have approximately 1.2 million participants, um, recreational activities, recreational anglers along our shoreline today. And the reasons for the decline are actually known. We know why the fishery resources are declining. There are high concentrations of fishing effort in nursery areas, particularly in estuarine areas, which are nursery areas. There's a high rate of retention amongst recreational anglers. In other words, most of what gets caught gets taken home. Okay? There's also, sadly, not much compliance. In other words, the people out there are not adhering to the size limits and the bag limits that are the regulations that they're meant to adhere to. And I think probably the reason for that is that there's a lack of law enforcement. We don't have enough law enforcement capacity out there to prevent that lack of compliance. Over and above the recreational anglers, we also have organized angling or sport angling, in which we've estimated there are probably about 500 competitions take place along our coastlines, which forces concentrated effort of probably your best group of anglers onto certain areas along the coastline, all of which puts a lot of pressure on our resources. And it's for this reason that I thought I'd better start engaging more with the user groups. Because just doing the science, publishing papers, limits the readership or the impact of that work. So over the last couple of years, I've um, been involved in a couple of initiatives to try and bridge that gap between the scientists and the recreational users. And we've done this using various me media. The first is um, providing what I call a series of tide charts. And, 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 and the thinking here is we, we wanted to use something which the anglers wanted, okay? So a tide chart is something an angler wants. And then on the tide chart, we provide a lot of information facts. Um, and in the case of the 2011 one, we provided all the, the, the um, do's and don'ts about catch and release angling. In other words, preaching good handling practices and stuff like that. However, similar to my research, I don't quite know what the impact of that sort of media is. Okay, they might print 100,000 copies, I don't know where they went to, or did anybody adhere to what we were trying to advocate there. The next one, which proved to be quite successful, we did a series of angling shows. Um, the focus was obviously on catch and release, um, and specifically the handling skills, and we did shows on beach fishing, estuarine fishing, as well as boat fishing, showing the best practice handling skills for catch and release angling. I think the impact of this, we know that television is a very um, a appropriate medium for getting your, your, your message across, and we've already heard that the production team are quite keen to do other, another round of this, so I think there we're doing some good. The other one is we've, we, we got involved with a couple of 
what we called clinics, and the name CARA was used, and it's actually the acronym for Catch and Release Angling Clinics. And we'd have specific themes for these clinics, and here we talk about lure fishing in estuaries. And I brought on board um, a seasoned pro, a well-known lure fisherman, a well-respected fisherman, Chris Schultz, uh, in the center of the screen there. And then we also brought in the industry. We brought in the tackle manufacturers and the distributors of fishing tackle, the manufacturers of lures, and they gave us prizes as well as um, sponsorship to hold these, these clinics. Um, and the aim of the clinics, again, was to provide the anglers with something that they want. So by using Chris's knowledge, we were able to improve their success rates by showing them or helping them um, to where, how, and when to catch fish. But at the same time, as we were going through the clinics, I used all the information known about the key species and fed them information about the biology, the behavior, as well as the vulnerability of the different species. And obviously, during the course of the clinics, we'd also encourage best practice, um, handing, hand, handling skills, and obviously encourage catch and release angling. And the philosophy behind this was quite simple. Um, and it's on the bottom of the screen there. It says, may your contribution be one of distinction and not extinction. The impact of this is also known. We, whenever we do have a, f a free weekend or something, we'll advertise to host another clinic. And within a week, we're fully booked. We have up to 30 people per clinic. So we know that there's a demand for it. Um, there's a lot of feedback on the internet with a lot of these um, fishing websites and blog sites. It's very, very popular. And I certainly think that the impact here in terms of getting the message across is working quite well. The last example I, I want to share with you is um, myself and my students have been involved with angling competitions for a number of years. And this one stands out uh, as a very good example. On the Sunday's estuary in the Eastern Cape Coast, we've been attending a big annual competition there for the last four to five years. And when we first started in 2008, we were actually doing a fishery survey. So we thought we'd take the opportunity to go to the tournament, the, the fishing competition, and interview anglers at the same time also collect biological information on the fish that were caught. The format of the competition then was they fished Friday night, the whole of Saturday, and the whole of Saturday night, basically kept and killed everything that was caught, and then there was a weigh-in and a prize giving on Sunday morning. And those are the pictures you see down the left-hand side of the screen. You can see the strings of fish coming in. In 2009, when we went back to the competition, I managed to raise some money, and we introduced a tag and release component to the competition, which was the Saturday during daytime hours, the first 20 fish that were um, caught that were in good enough condition for us to tag and release. We tagged, and there were prizes for those fish that were tagged and released. And the emphasis was not on the most fish or the biggest fish or anything. It was, again, the health and the condition of the fish the guys were awarded with a prize, as long as the fish was in good enough condition for us to tag and release. So it was a step in the right direction. In 2010, I went back to the organizers of the competition. I said, why don't we do away with a Friday night of fishing? And we introduced a Mardi Gras type approach where the club was selling food and booze. We gave, and gave presentations on the work that we were doing there. And it turned out it was a bit of a win-win, okay? The club started making more money um, <laughs> the, fish, the fish were saved for an extra night of, of, of fishing pressure. Okay, so that's where the win-win started. And last year, we introduced a full catch and release competition. We got sponsorships from one of the tackle dealers that all the boats that participated had knotless landing nets. We gave them a lecture first on how to handle the fish and what to do with the fish. Basically, every fish that was caught never came out of the water. They were held in the water in the, in the soft landing nets. We had a team of researchers. They'd phone us, we went up, we were the only ones that handled the fish, we tagged all the fish, we ended up on the Saturday and the Sunday night, we tagged 74 fish, no fish died, and again, it was now win, 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 because the fish were saved on the Friday night. All of them survived. We managed to get research data through the tagging of the fish, and the angling club also benefited. If you look at the top left, that's what the angling club looked like in 2008. And if you look at the bottom right, that's what it looks like at the moment. So clearly they have benefited from a change <laughs> in the format of the competition. Also, as I say, I've always got to sign, um, get some <coughs> feedback in terms of my worth. Has it been worth it? And this is this internet blog site that I was telling you about. And Chris, my citizen scientist, posted a thing last weekend was the 33rd annual interclub competition on the Sunday's estuary. 
This was the first time in a 32-year history of the competition no dead fish uh, counted towards the final results. And the feedback was absolutely amazing. And this is where I started feeling that my worth as a scientist is at least showing something. Okay? And you just have to go through some of those blogs that were posted. It said, what a great initiative to fishing comps. Not one fish killed. Awesome. I would love to take part in a comp like that sometime. Great news. Glad to see the comps leaning towards catch and release. Just imagine if all those fish were killed for points. A lot of resident fish still happy at home, thanks to you guys. Lacquer, meaning nice, report. An awesome initiative having a full catch and release competition. Hats off to you guys. And the last one was somebody that I know. He said, awesome. It's taken you guys a long time to get it done, uh, get it right. Well done. So <laughs> that's the positive feedback. As I say, within my science career, I would never, ever get that sort of feedback with our papers. And <laughs> in fact, the, the, honest, the honesty of it, I was not going to say this, but I will say it. I've just recently uh, filled in all my re-evaluation documents, and my worth was that 10 of my publications have been, have been cited more than 10 times. And that's what really started making me wonder wh what I should be doing. Should I rather concentrate on this stuff, which is having an impact, or sticking with that funny science game? I just want to end off possibly by presenting a couple of challenges. And the challenges, and I'm calling them the TEDx challenges, to the angling community out there, and we're talking about the recreational sector here. Firstly, to the competitive anglers and to the organizers of competition. The challenge is to adopt catch and release only policy to all the fishing competitions in South Africa and also apply best practices to ensure the survival of those fish. It's all very well using lip service conservation and say we're going to do catch and release competitions and the fish get gaffed before they get weighed and put back. Okay, it's a clear distinction in terms of ensuring survival of the fish. And the other one is just to the average recreational angler out there. Do not see your next outing as an opportunity to go and catch something to put it into the pan. There are fish shops. There are already dead fish you can actually go and purchase. Those fish that are alive are worth a lot more. So the challenge there is become more responsible, promote a sustainable future. And the future is about those youngsters, the next generation. Thank you very much.